And we always encourage the young people. I'm just, I'm grateful for Terry Lay's, several, you know how I'm bad about people do things for years and years and they do it well and we never say anything about it, but I appreciate all the work for the children's church. Those two groups are dismissed if you're so inclined. There's a younger group of pre-readers and then an older group for second to fifth grade, if those who are readers, if you want to go in that group, but I appreciate that staff. <clears throat> for those of us who remain Disney people will probably recall that I have pretty much stolen the title for this sermon from Snow White. You know, whistle while you work. <whistles> dun, 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 dun. No. But, but, but due to some cultural concerns, you'll see that I've added a word. Whistle while you actually work. Do you know anybody who just doesn't want to work? This perceived decline of work ethic in modern American culture continues to be a bone of contention, and the divide is sometimes greatest and most volatile between the generations, between the kiddos and the codgers, we'll call them, the old-timers. When a bunch of folk my age or older get together, it's not too long before somebody will make a comment about work ethic, which is often then followed by what statement? Kids today are lazy. They eat detergent for crying out loud. Now, I'm going to note at the outset that they, when I use the word they, that is a broad characterization, okay? Not every young person is eating Tide Pods, okay? None of them that I know are eating Tide Pods. And you and I both know that not every person under 30 is lazy, just as you and I know not every person over 50 works, okay? And I'm personally of a mind that as far as the eating detergent, I bet on some farm in some state some decades ago, this conversation actually happened. Hey, Merle, this is a chunk of Ma's lye soap. If you chew it up and swallow every bit of it, I'll do your chores for a week. You know that happened. The only difference is that Merle doesn't have YouTube to share his stupidity with the planet. You know, that, that's the only difference. You know, so we are going to acknowledge on both sides of the spectrum, these are broad brushstrokes, um, some of them are stereotypical, generalizations, and all of that factors in wrongly sometimes, but at the heart of it is a real concern that needs addressed. What does work look like in modern contemporary culture? How do you evaluate if someone's being effective? Because so many things in our life change from generation to generation, and some of these change very rapidly. Uh, The senior saints among us, those in their 80s and 90s, uh, they they had a different type of plumbing situation in their house growing up, if it was in the house. In days gone by, uh, medicine was a little bit different, right? Communication, phones were... Different? Transportation was vastly different from what they are today. And work and effort has likewise changed greatly over the course of recent decades for people my grandparents' age, people who were born in the early 1900s. The question, hey, what are we having for dinner, could have been answered by what? Well, what are you going to go out and catch, hunt, pick, raise, or clean? You go get it, and we'll eat it. For people my age, what are we having for dinner was answered by whatever mom stopped and picked up in that little styrofoam shrink-wrapped container and put in a microwave. That's what we have for dinner. And for the youngest today, what are we having for dinner could mean taking a nap and whatever Uber or Grubhub or DoorDash brings to your door hot and ready to eat. The way dinner is provided has changed. For people my grandparents' age, play was in the barn with your siblings after everybody's chores were done. For people my age, play meant on the field with your teammates 
after supper was over. And for some of us today, play can mean on your device, wherever there's a connection, anytime, day or night, with people all over the world, most of whom you'll never meet. Playing has changed. You know, and again, I, I'm stating, for the record, these are broad generalizations to make a point. I certainly am not saying everything about technology is inherently wrong. We use it, we benefit from it. In this room, we have HVAC, uh, digital sound, video. We have indoor plumbing, <laughs> coffee maker. You know. we, we use them. What, what I am suggesting, would you agree that the overall progression in these changes is from more physical effort to less? Would you agree with that? That work today often demands less physical effort than it did 100 years ago. It takes less effort, less energy to tap a screen than it did to pluck a chicken. It, it takes less effort to tap on my screen than it did to climb a rope in the haymow. And, and because of that, because of our demands and our definitions of work have changed, some of us have a hard time wrestling with that. And we, we try to figure out what, what should work or work effort or ethic look like for a Christian person in 2018 American. And we're not the first culture to have to wrestle with this. Uh, this is actually an ancient problem. Uh, Paul is going to address this. Turn with me again to First and Second Thessalonians toward the end of your Bible, these black pew Bibles. It's page 987. We've been going through these five sermons. What, what are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting for Jesus to return, for the second coming? And this issue here is hit squarely and rather bluntly in both of these letters. Turn with me again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to begin by reading verses 11 and 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Why did he have to tell them that? Because apparently some of the people in the church had quit working. And there, there are two leading theories that are put out there why this might be. The, the first, the older one, was that some of the people in the church got to thinking, well, Jesus come back soon, why bother? I'm not going to cut the grass, don't need to fix a hole in the roof, let's just go out on the hill with the family and we'll sit and sing and look at the sky and Jesus is coming back, so don't bother with the work. And, and the second theory that's actually probably picking up more steam now is, is that it would appear that some of the people in the church had figured out, hey, I don't need to work because some of my Christian brothers and sisters are really good at it. So I'll let you do it. You do the work, and we'll all eat the food. How's that? And this is clearly a problem for this congregation, because Paul uses similar, albeit stronger, language in the second letter. Turn over a page or two to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and sometime later he's going to hit him again. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They're not busy, they're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And do, do we really need to take a lot of time to explain the words? I did not encounter a lot of difficult Greek original words with these bizarre definitions. 
pretty straightforward. And doesn't that kind of sound rather contemporary? Sadly, it does. There are some people who don't want to work. And there are some people who measure differently. And you can see the, the blanks on the outline. We'll look at some, some indicators, if you will. We'll, we'll look at a couple. We'll just kind of brush them aside quickly and then spend a a little bit more time on the other two that, that are more biblical and more enduring. Now, the first one being income. Income is not the best barometer of work ethic. Nowhere in this passage of Scripture does it teach that the people who work the hardest will make the most. We might like to think that, but that's not what... I believe that a lot of people today would agree with this broad, general statement. Teachers are underpaid and athletes are overpaid. That's broad, but I think, you know, by and large, farmers should make more than they do. Film stars should make less. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that athletes and movie stars don't work. And I understand the arguments and the sacrifices and the hours that they put in and time in the gym every day and the diets and studying. I understand all the arguments. I know it's work, but I'm just speaking for myself. Is it worth $7 million a year or 12 or 36? Is it worth 100 times more than the people in the pews make in a year for the effort they put forth? Honestly. You know, as a model, are you paid millions because it's a long-term work ethic or does it have a little bit to do with your bone structure? You know, as a basketball player, is it total work ethic, or it's the fact that you're seven feet, two inches tall. You know? Or you're a lineman who is six foot seven, you weigh 295 pounds, and you can run 40 yards in 4.8 seconds. Some of that factors in. It's not all work ethic. It's the same thing with the business world. You know, how, how many multi-million dollar salaries are solely because of work ethic, and how many are because that particular employee's last name is Ford or Mars? Or Walton. And again, I'm not saying that they don't work and they sacrifice. But just income is not always the best barometer of work ethic, cross the board. I income's not even the best barometer of contentment. This is the famously wealthy, uh, intelligent King Solomon, and this is his conclusion about hefty incomes from Ecclesiastes 5.12. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Said a very rich man who spent all his time worried about his stuff. You know. And that second one is physicality. Physicality is not the best barometer of work ethic. I don't know if anybody here remembers the good old days when everybody put in a full day's honest work. Because you're going to key on that word. Mm, everybody? I don't know about that. You know, and if I'm not careful, I spend my time assuming that everything in the past was good and perfect and everything in the present is foolish, and that's not true. You know, a lot of people can count their steps today. Would you conclude that because Denise gets more steps in a given day than I do, that she works harder than I do? I would say some days she does. Some days she doesn't. You know, it, it's... It's not the color of your collar, blue or white. It's not whether you sit or stand. It's not whether your work is more mental or physical. I'm try I think of those circles, like a symbiotic circle. You've got a researcher who's sitting here at his desk, and he's experimenting and creating and developing technologies and information, and he's eating at his desk while he works. And he's eating the food that the farmer has provided, helped to grow and harvest, while the farmer uses the equipment and the research and the information that the engineer has provided. And, and those two help each other. You know. There are jobs where you do not need to expend as much physical energy as you used to, but it's still work. And Wayne and I went to see Betty Case just this past Wednesday, and Betty is talking about her husband, Boyce, who spent 40 years as an iron worker working on girders with rivets, has a plaque on the wall. Got 40 years, got a plaque this big. Man broke his, literally broke his back doing that work. And for the lifetime, the childhood of his boys, he kept urging both boys, go push a pencil. <laughs> that was his suggestion to them. Do desk work. You know? 
I was trying to picture, say, say a, a grandson comes home from his city job and he comes home to the farm and it's late at night and he pulls in and it's dark and he says, hey, pops, grandpa's sitting there, you know, what'd you do today? And, and grandpa says, well, it's, it's dark out now, but when you get up in the morning, you look down the lane and you'll see acreage on both sides. He said, I worked all that ground today. I worked 100 acres today. And I get that number from Charlie Reese because I asked Charlie, all farms are different, equipment size is different. But Charlie said, on a good day, a long day, work hard, 100 acres. That's what Grandpa got done. And he asked over the dinner table to the grandson, what would you get done? He says, I, re- I responded to 87 emails today. You know. Now hopefully both sides of the table understand that there was work. And, and sometimes, physical, you know anybody that just rushes around and there's a lot of physical activity, but they don't actually get anything done. The dust settles, and they haven't really accomplished anything. You pushed a lot of equipment around, but you didn't actually do any work. Somebody's covering for you. And I, I, I look, even Snow White had help. Remember that picture? She didn't do all that cleaning by herself. Look at it. It's a team effort. The Woodland Custodial Department <laughs> helped her a lot. Because I counted in the, in the video clip, 19 chipmunks, 10 squirrels, Nine rabbits, eight birds, a deer, her fawn, a raccoon, and a turtle. They all helped do the work. My sons can get a lot of work done outside office and or classroom walls. I understand that. It is a different world now. How many people can, we can work, do some if not all of our job from home? It's possible. I went home the other day and Brandon was sitting on the couch working. In t-shirt, shorts, and socks. You know, ESPN is on the TV. He has his laptop plugged into our Wi-Fi, and his phone is charged in our electricity. He can do the exact work that he does in the office. The trick is what? To actually do the work. You know, I have seen both our boys at our house on the weekend with their laptop out. It's sa- I, look, I talked to both of them. I said, Saturday, it's your day off. What are you doing? And they said, it needs done. Now, to me, you may not say that's super physical, but that's a commendable work ethic. And and the same is now true of my job. I don't have to be in my office to write a sermon anymore. I don't have to be in the building to answer a phone call. I don't have to stay within these walls to, to meet you for a discussion. And if it's not a personal, private matter, I'd much prefer we go to Chipotle or Raising Cane's or Skyline. That'd be great. You know? And if it's personal, it's private, you don't want anybody else to hear, we'll do that on the golf course. You know? <laughs> or at the pond. i got options you know, for, for those things. You know, it's, the work environment continues to evolve. You can work very diligently without it being singly physically draining. You know? and, and having made that argument, I think that part of that's what frustrates some, some of us. You agree with what I just said. I agree. You do not have to sweat buckets or pull muscles to do your job. So why didn't you do your job? You only had one job. It's a very simple job. And you didn't get it done. You know, I have, personally, I have been disappointed by a woman and a man uh, recently regarding... They're not in the room. Don't look around. They're not here. Okay. <laughs> But all I asked was for a contribution that I thought would enhance the worship experience. And I gave them both an out. If you can't do it, text me, let me know. Neither of them got it done. Neither of them had the ability to send those three words in text says, hey, I can't. One job. And I understand that the work world is changing it's frustration. You know, if you're not going to judge by income, if you're not going to judge by physicality, what's the standard? How do you measure what matters? How about contribution? Contribution is a better measure of work ethic. This is the heart of Paul's concern with some of these Thessalonian people. Why aren't you contributing? If you can't, that's different. If you can't, or this is not a message for someone who longs to work, but they're physically or mentally unable to that's different. This is a challenge for somebody who could, but they don't. And Paul cuts right to the heart of it. He cuts right to the stomach of it. If you don't work, you don't eat. Do you know anybody who doesn't want to work? Do you know anybody who doesn't want to eat? 
A, a coworker, a guy that used to work in the post office with Denise, he got moved to the mail sorting plant downtown, put in charge of a department, immediately had to fire six people because they wouldn't work. And one kid was tardy 12 days out of the last 30. And he told the boss, he said, I just can't get up. I can't get up. And my mom tries to come in and help me, but she can't get me up. And my girlfriend tries to come in and wake me up, and she can't get me up. Kicker on that? He works second shift. You don't have to get up till three in the afternoon. <laughs> well, I can't do it. It's too hard. You know? What what do people in your workplace think? And I, they don't Christian people or, or non believers, what do they think when somebody is too lazy to do their job? And and we've come a long way in this country where there are some people who seem to be quite content to just be dependent on others' efforts, but I still think there's a majority of people out there who appreciate a work ethic that, in, when it boils down, produces more than it consumes. That's a simple standard. And, and Paul's not just preaching this work ethic to the Thessalonians. If you want to look, this is Ephesians 4 to the people in Ephesus, chapter 4, verse 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. It's not enough to just stop stealing and take care of yourself. Do some work so that you can contribute more than you consume. This might be an honest self-evaluation point. Does that describe my work ethic? Have I bought into this bare minimum effort lie? And you see all the examples of people who do as little as possible. I'll, I'll put some images up here. Put the first one up and we can consider what, what's going on here. I just install benches, man. Don't ask me to put it where it's not going to get drained on. They said the bench goes here. That's where it goes. I'm moving on. The second person, those can't be more than six inches apart. You can clearly see where one plate was designed to... to Ah, oh, too late now. I already put them down. You know, I'm not going to switch them. That'd be too much work. And the third one, this guy, did, I just build roofs, man. I, I don't. <laughs> not my job to move that ladder. You know, it's a plague you know, to just <laughs> simply do more than you were asked to do or contribute more than was required. And Paul goes again in 2 Thessalonians 3. You say, why is he addressing the same problem in the second letter? He, just, he covered this in the first letter. Do your work so you won't be dependent on it. He's already covered it. Why does he have to do it again? Because the nice words in the first letter didn't get the job done. And there are some people who are still struggling. They're sitting around, let other people do all the work. God is not pleased. So Paul has stronger language in the second letter, which is essentially stay away from the lazy people. And I love the way this is how the message translates, just laying it out there in verse 6. Our orders, backed up by the Master Jesus, are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to work the way we taught you. Don't permit them to freeload on the rest. Whistle while you actually work. It's not a matter. We're not going to rank by how much money you make or how physically taxing your work is. What are you producing? What is your contribution to the cause? And I, this is just me thinking that I think this, as things have become less physically demanding, you know, as, as there's, there's a lack of, there's less physical evidence. You know, the grandpa farmer says, look out there, I worked 100 acres. You can see that. What's 87 emails look like? And, and we've, we've come to that, and, and it's, it's maybe starting to be a, a detriment. All you had to do was, and, and you couldn't get that done. And I don't know if it's affecting people of all ages. You say, well, you know, really, well, it, it didn't take that much physical effort, so it's really not that big of a deal that I didn't get it done. Why, why, why are you so bothered about that? All I forgot to do was text you. Is it really that big of a deal? It's not like I forgot to take your car back to the airport so you could have a ride home when your plane lands. It's not like I forgot to build you a house so you have a place to live. All I forgot was a couple of these taps and hit send. It can't be that big of a deal. Well, it is to me. Because it was still an important contribution. 
Because the sermon wasn't everything that it could have been. The service wasn't everything that maybe it could have been. And sometimes on those particular Sundays, that one individual who was here for the first time and never came back didn't hear what they could have heard if you would have put in what we asked. It wasn't a big ask physically. But that's all the more reason I get upset when it wasn't done. Just stop measuring things by how much I get paid or how much sweat it requires. How, am I contributing? What impact do I have or not have? And I, if you're physically willing to, to raise your hand, <laughs> raise your hand if you've ever had to cover at work because a coworker called off sick. Anybody? <laughs> now ball that up into a fist if you found out they weren't really sick. <laughs> they just partied too hard on the weekend. You know? And if you've ever felt like a coworker wasn't contributing, remember how that feels for just a moment. Because the way you and I watch and judge other people is the same way they watch and judge us. And for the Christian, what do they add to that? People watch us work, and our level of effort impacts what they think about Jesus. Which, maybe this fourth one's the best. How, how does my work ethic reflect Jesus? That, that's perhaps the most valuable indicator in all of this. I don't care. Blue-collar work, white-collar work, outside work, inside work, earned income work, volunteer labor, any of your work. How does my work affect my Lord. In this verse, Colossians 3.23, we use often, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. That, that's our reasoning. That's our rationale for doing our best effort in our job every day. And when we do that, the lost people around us, they will still take note. And I look back at 1 Thessalonians 4. 11 and 12, and he says, lead a quiet life, work with your hands, mind your own business. Why? And he'll say in the text, so the outsiders, so the non-believers will respect you. And tied to that, will respect your faith, your Christianity. If you're one of those people, you just feel like, I, I am trying to do that. I am working diligently to seemingly no avail, day after day after day. Paul has a, a word for that too, an answer. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. Never tire of doing what is right. You see, there's this one, it's one sentence that's surrounded by conversation about lazy people. And you might feel like you're that one worker who's surrounded by lazy people. Never tire of doing what is right. Even if you're the only one. You know. how, how, how does a good work ethic reflect on Jesus. Picture, how do you picture Jesus as a, as a worker? First in his carpentry job as a young man and then as a preacher, teacher, traveler. How, how do you think he worked? I picture diligent, accurate, delivered the project on time, highest quality. He would teach and walk and feed and share late into the night. He would be up at first light. He would be willing to listen to somebody after an entire long day of work. How, how do you see Jesus? How'd he work? When I work the way he worked, people will notice. And sometimes after a long enough noticing, they're going to ask you. And you get to share something about your faith. And that could be the greatest contribution to your coworker's life you ever make. Doesn't matter how physical your labor is or how much either one of you earns. Let's pray and we'll close. Father God, we are grateful for the tasks that you have given us, whether it drains us more physically or mentally or sometimes one, one day and the other the next. But we thank you for opportunities to contribute in the world uh, which we inhabit today and the, the culture and the climate and the, and the tools and the technology that we'll all use tomorrow. We just pray that we can be mindful of that which is an accurate indication. Pray that we would have something to share with those uh, in need. We pray that our efforts would reflect uh, what we think of Jesus. 
It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We will continue to encourage you, to invite you. Maybe you know, like, I'd love to do some of these things that the scripture talks about, but I can't do that alone. Uh, none of us can do this alone. There is an invitation to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to allow the Holy Spirit to enable you and empower you to do things none of us can do on our own. So we would invite you to maybe you need to make a decision and come to the front. Let's stand together and we'll sing this invitation. So come to the altar.
Appreciate it. Could you just be seated for a moment? A couple things that we want to share with you as, as far as tonight, 7 o'clock. Don't forget, we're reverting, going back to, we're starting tonight at 7 o'clock, and the banquet's Friday. It's not too late, ladies, to sign up if you can attend, or gentlemen, boys, if you can help serve. Uh, Jeff Barrett out there, right there in the doorway. Anything you need on that, sir? Okay. Okay, looking for a couple more to serve that. Like I said, if, if you need to add to that count, today is the day to do that. And for the pictorial directories, um, you probably got an email this week. If you don't have one contributed yet, you have some options there. Uh, I'll submit one, take one of us, use the old directory. We don't want any. You know, but make sure you let us know because we're trying to finish that. And there's a, an address directory on the table. You can check that. You can either edit it, cross it out. Put a green highlighter on there to say, yeah, that's okay. It's just the address portion it just goes in the back of the booklet. But check those as far as the directories, if you would. And as far as, trying to think of anything else. Um, I don't know if you caught on the, the short video that we showed from Summer in the Sun. Um, we we're actually able to have some of the stars of that video here with us this morning to share what life is really like. If you want to show them that image, we took a screenshot of that actual video. And there's people that you might recognize in there, because if so good, you might have to double click on it. <laughs> but I saw Adrian, Daniel, is Ethan, is that your head there? In the back, yeah. cherishes hair. But uh, we're, we're gonna take a few minutes and have some of these young people just share personally what it's like uh, for Summer in the Sun. So you guys wanna take a few moments? Sure. Um, okay, so Summer in the Sun um, is at Kentucky Christian University. I'm sure most of you know that by now. Um, which is really small, and there's a really good pizza place there, and we always go, and it's really good. So, <laughs> um, some things that we do are like, oh gosh, <laughs> we start off the morning with um, worship and main session, and Cherish is going to tell you about those, and um, then as we go throughout the day, we go through some workshops and encounter time. Workshops, um, you can kind of choose which ones you want to go to. There's about 10, would you say? There's about 10 different ones, and most of them are like two days. So you could go to one on Monday and Tuesday, and the next one on uh, Thursday, Friday, or Wednesday, Thursday. Huh? I know the days of the week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and basically, there's just a bunch of different things that you can look at. Um, you can look at moral issues. Um, there's a girls' workshop, a guys' workshop, normally, that you can go in and, and obviously, like, go to your, you know. <laughs> You're a girl, yeah. <laughs> um, and a lot of the teachers are professors at KCU, so they, they're really chill and they know um, a lot about uh, how teens work and how young adults um, think and how we can uh, impact the world. So we learn a lot that way. And then Encounter Time is kind of like a smaller main session and it kind of, um, you go into this place and you meet a bunch of different people from different youth groups all over the East Coast. And it's it's cool because you get to interact with them and kind of discuss your personal experiences in life about um, how you've come to God and how you've learned it sits and stuff like that. So that's cool. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you about the main sessions. So basically the main sessions are in the morning and in the evening and they have everyone come together and there is worship and they have a worship band there that leads worship and um, I just said worship a lot of times. <laughs> music. They play music. We sing. And um, it's kind of like set up like a concert but like Jesus concert. Um, and so you can come to the front if you want to or just stay in your seats and everyone just kind of sings together and is worshiping. Um, and after the music section, everyone sits down. They have, I don't know why I'm shaking. I'm talking. So, <laughs> anyway, everyone sits down. They have a speaker for the week. And the speaker delivers a message. And I think sometimes, me going into it, at least I grew up in church. Um, I've been in the youth group for like six years. So I was like, you know, I've been to all the retreats, the camps. They're going to tell a Bible story. They're going to make a connection. Like, it's going to be cool, but nothing I've never heard before. And um, the speakers always talk about how they've prayed for like months about what God wants them to say. And um, God really works with them, and he speaks to everyone in that room. And I think it's just really cool to not only see him working in your own life when you didn't even think you needed it, or seeing him work in your youth group's life. 
I agree with everything they've said and everything they've talked about. Um, I'd also like to talk about like when you're in this room with all these Christians, whether they're just coming up in their faith or they've been a devout Christian their entire life, you can learn a lot from a lot of different people or you can be an example for a lot of people. And I think to be a part of something like that is something that you don't get to experience every day and that if you have this opportunity, I would take it and you can be a part of this worship where you go up with all these people and your youth group and you can grow together, laugh together, cry together. There's a lot of different things you can do. These workshops, they can teach you a lot and they're a great opportunity and exercise for you to do with your youth group. Um, great teachers, like Jordi said, and again, it's a great opportunity for you to grow in your faith and with your youth group. I was fairly new to the church when I first went, and after I came back, I mean, now these are my lifelong friends that I can honestly say that they're my best friends and they're my second family, pretty much. So, yeah, you should definitely try since 2018. What's <laughs> that? And I'll fit one of the kids as well, because I was fortunate enough to be able to go as a sponsor one year. And uh, they say how awesome it is from a youth perspective, and it is. But I learned a lot, and um, it's just an awesome time. So we definitely encourage you to, to go to SITS while you have the chance. Uh, let's go ahead and close by singing God Be With You to Be With You.